Hello, and welcome back to the third episode of See Chris Learn, the only channel on the internet where you get to watch me ramble on about science that I totally understand. Today, I will be introducing you to the interesting and colorful world of geologic mapping. Seriously, super colorful. But before we get to that, let's start at the beginning. Geologic mapping is a graphic portrayal of the physical reality of a surface. It shows the distribution and sequence of rock types, structural features such as folds and faults, and other similar information. Think of it as a graph. A geologist looks at it and they can immediately see the layout of the land, the types of rocks they're dealing with, and how each of those rocks relates to each other. On Earth, geomapping mapping is very hands-on. Uh, the maps are created with a mixture of field work, lab studies and analyses of aerial photographs. In regular people terms, what it looks like from the ground, what it looks like altogether, and what it's made out of. The terrestrial planets are a lot harder to map. Um, obviously, we can't see what it looks like from the ground. People not being a large commodity of the workforce on, you know, like Mars. Uh, lab studies are possible, but extremely expensive, and presumably it just takes forever. I mean, after all, you have to get the specimens from the planet back to the lab. Um, so how do, how do they graph something so far away? Well, aerial photographs mostly. Um, they study the morphology, the shape of the land, the albedo character characteristics, the tone of the rock, be it light or dark, color surface preservation, which is, you know, erosion versus no erosion, and other properties, but not only photographs are used to discover these features. For instance, the atmosphere of Venus is so thick and heavy that we can't really see the surface of the planet, so most of the photos of the surface are actually visual representations of radar. So after deciding how to section out the mapping into quadrants based on areas that have similar features and characteristics, scientists have to sit down to figure out how old everything is. The first will sound very familiar. It's called the principle of superposition, and it basically states that rock is laid down one layer at a time. So the closer to the surface something is, the younger it is. Like Kono and Sparin, the uh, volcano in the Chasma from the last episode. Little did you know, and well, little did I know, that that whole rock is a timeline thing had an actual name. The other theories follow similar patterns. The law of cross-cutting states that for a rock unit to be Modified, it must first exist. While that sounds more like philosophy than geology, it's a very similar principle to the principle of superposition. If a chasma cuts through a crater, the crater had to have existed before the chasma. Um, embayment is the exact same principle, except it pertains to the units of rock. The, you know, this is all craters and this is all volcanic plains, um, instead of the individual geologic features like chasma and... Um, and craters. <laughs> um, and impact crater distributions are the same as embayments, um, but more and bigger impacts mean an older unit of cratering. So scientists sit down and they figure out what the oldest feature is and what the youngest feature is, and they put everything together so that you can see visually how everything happened. Of course, it's never that easy. If someone tells you it's that easy, kick them in the shins. They're lying to you. But that's why the maps also come with the written portion. We'll call it like the artist statement. Um, it talks about how the features were probably formed and interprets the modification of the existing features in chronological order, because otherwise it would be too confusing. The last part of geologic mapping is a table, because of course it is. Science would be nothing if not for tables and graphs. Each of these tables could be termed a graphic representation of the verbal written interpretation of the graphic representation of a physical reality. And if that doesn't make your head spin, you should probably look into becoming a scientist. The tables themselves are actually pretty self-explanatory, though. The first table is just the layers. Uh, don't let the word stratigraphic scare you. Um, it's all just a timeline stuff I was talking about. The geologic units are the different areas grouped by the geologic processes, so you know one area is all craters and one area is lava floodplains and all of that. Um, the structural events are presumably the actual geologic processes that happened and changed it, like tectonic activity. And the second table describes how the geologic units were created. Simple as that. So now we come back to this picture. Uh, this is Hecate, a quadrant on Venus that's also known by its official title, Hecate Chasma Quadrant, V28. Um, in the next episode, I'll take you through this picture and apply all the different things I discussed today to this particularly scary-looking map. But for now, I'm going to talk about Hecate, the goddess. 
Hecate is an interesting goddess. Much like, you know, Venus Aphrodite, she's an older goddess, a uh, chthonic, but she's not a titan. She did exist before the Olympians, though. Um, unlike Aphrodite, who actually has, like, a, a birth myth in Greek mythology, Hecate wasn't born. The Greeks just sort of inherited her, I guess? Early depictions of Hecate show her to with a single face, uh, but later depictions actually show her with three aspects, the maiden, mother, and crone. She's often depicted with two hounds, a key, or torches. Uh, she's supposed to be a goddess with power over magic and with witchcraft, darkness, the moon, the crossroads, and she also has a possible connection to the dead, which is why, aside from Hades and Hermes, she was the only Greek god who could enter and exit the realm of Hades at will. She's actually the goddess who went and convinced Hades to let Persephone go back to her mother. Now, personally, I like Hecate because of her sort of chthonic past. She's a dark primordial goddess, um, more powerful and mysterious than the rest of the Greek pantheon, and she's also just less, I guess, researched in, you know, the modern heyday of Greek god excitement, Percy Jackson, all of that. Um, she, I mean, she's a goddess who actually made Zeus take a step back and respect her. Um, and I guess I prefer the triple aspect of her because I feel like it better encompasses the mystery and the unknowable, you know, whatever that of, of her. Um, she's a goddess of darkness and of the dark of the moon, but she's also a guide. She's the goddess of liminal space, a space in between changing, and I don't think you can get much cooler than that. So next week, we'll see if the Hecate Quadrant can hold a candle to the goddess that it's named after. Spoiler! That depends on whether or not you think planetary geology is cool. Until then, rock on and keep it classic.